I hope everybody can see it. Oh, well, okay. So hi everybody and happy to see you. Uh, today, uh, our speaker is uh, Igor Kavkine from uh, the Institute of Mathematics uh, in Prague. And he will tell us about uh, uh, finite array normalizations in locally convariant perturbative algebraic quantum field theory. So thank you, Igor, for accepting our invitation and the stage well, is yours. Thanks to Eugenio for the introduction and also for the invitation. Uh, I think I have not presented in, in this seminar before, so I'm glad to have the, the opportunity finally. <clears throat> Um, so I'm, I will talk about uh, something which uh, uh, probably is not so familiar to to the audience. Uh, so uh, uh, and in particular, um, the, the the references that you see uh, here. Uh, sorry. So the references that you see here. Uh, which are my own work on, on the subject, my own contributions are, are quite technical. So I'll probably uh, spend more time kind of talking about the, kind of giving an introduction to, to the topic, uh, an informal one, and uh, we'll say some things about uh, the, my technical contributions closer to the end. So um, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions, uh, especially because I'm not going to be uh, explain everything in complete detail. So if you want some explanations, uh, some more explanations, just, just ask. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> so w one thing I want to kind of uh, preview is this, uh, the, to explain this term finite in finite denormalizations. Um, uh, finite could be the opposite of uh, infinitesimal, but it'll, it'll, could also be the opposite of, of infinite. And this is kind of the, the way it's being used here. So uh, if you know about infinite renormalizations uh, in Q of T by subtracting infinities, finite renormalizations are what are left over after you've already subtracted the, the infinities. Uh, okay. So <clears throat> the first four slides are kind of introduction to the context in which the, the work um, uh, that I'm talking about is uh, where that it belongs to. Uh, and they're a bit dense, but I'll try to uh, kind of uh, ex explain uh, uh, what's going on. Um, although I, I hope that I can rely on everybody being familiar with kind of a basic course on quantum field theory that you would have taken in, in graduate school. Um, all right, so let's suppose that we have some quantum fields uh, defined on a manifold M. And uh, I want to consider, uh, so it takes my field operator, phi of x, uh, and uh, I smear it with a test function. So f is going to be a, um, a smooth function on M with uh, compact support. Uh, and uh, this smearing, uh, sometimes denoted like this, is, is um, uh, uh, the basic example of what we call a localized observable. Uh, so it's localized right, because uh, it uh, consists of uh, combinations of the, the fields uh, belonging to different space-time points. Uh, and uh, so the, the domain to which this observable is localized uh, is considered to be the, the support of the this function, uh, test function f. Uh, and uh, usually it's uh, an unbounded self-adjoint operator on the Hilbert space of states, Hilbert space uh, is curly H. And if you want to think of a concrete example, think of a free quantum field uh, that you can uh, construct using textbook methods, uh, relativistic free quantum field. All right, so what we can do is we can take uh, examples of uh, um, localized observables of this type and more complicated types uh, and uh, collect them in, into uh, by localization. So you take some open subset of the space time uh, and then collect all observables that are uh, localized within it. Uh, and uh, this will be in general, uh, well, this will be closed under multiplication. Uh, uh, 
as, as these, these operators provided you, you know, uh, multiply things on common domains and so on. Uh, and it's, uh, so it's going to be an algebra, a non-commutative algebra. Uh, often uh, the star conjugation or complex conjugation is, uh, is important. So, so people talk about star algebras in this context. All right. So in algebraic quantum field theory, these are the algebras that, that we have in mind. Okay, so these algebras associated to um, uh, domains in, in space-time uh, satisfy some um, nice properties, at least in examples that we can control, uh, like, for example, uh, monotonicity, or in, in, in the literature you find more technical terms like isotonicity. Uh, but it just means that uh, when you have two uh, regions and one is smaller than the other, then uh, the uh, algebra corresponding to the smaller domain sits inside the algebra uh, corresponding to the larger one. Okay, and if you abstract this away and you know make these abstract algebras, then this will be like an injective hom homomorphism of algebra. Um, another uh, important property satisfied by these algebras is microcausality. Uh, so we're dealing with relativistic quantum field theories. Uh, so there's a notion of uh, space-like separation uh, between uh, regions. So let's see if I can uh, sketch uh, what that would, that would look like, right? So if I have some, some domain here, and I have another domain, you know, far away, so that no light signal can reach between them. So these two domains, U and V, are uh, space-like separated. Um, so can you still see my my pointer? Not anymore. No. Okay. Uh, but we solve the domains. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm back. Uh, okay. So uh, if if the domains U and V are uh, space-like separated, then you they commute, and uh, this is uh, mm, uh, called microcausality, or uh, it's a part of the canonical commutation relations in relativistic quantum field theory. Okay. So these are some properties that uh, we want to keep in general. Uh, so at some point, you know, people decided to get together and uh, write down a list of axioms that such algebras uh, localized on space-time regions uh, should satisfy. And this is what became algebraic quantum field theory. So it's kind of like an axiomatic framework uh, where you can uh, <clears throat> work with, um, uh, you know, these axioms saying like, oh, they have some general implications, or you can try to build examples that fit into these, right, into these axioms. Uh, <clears throat> so the uh, basic uh, uh, motivation for considering the algebras of observables as abstract algebras separate from any particular representation on, on the Hilbert space is that um, in general, there exist uh, multiple inequivalent representations of the kinds of algebras that we find in uh, relativistic quantum field theory. Um, and uh, so what you, by, by taking the algebra separately, you separate, you know, you can study their properties uh, separately and you can study their representations on Hilbert spaces separately. Uh, and uh, that is necessary under some conditions because physically inequivalent, sorry, uh, inequivalent representations uh, of the algebras of, observable, of observables uh, correspond to, could correspond to distinct physical uh, um, situations. So for example, zero temperature or vacuum states uh, could, be, uh, could belong to inequivalent representations to thermal states, so states at uh, non-zero non temperatures. Or uh, for example, if you have a theory uh, that, that has some states uh, that have uh, broken symmetries or spontaneously broken symmetries. So these such states could belong to inequivalent representations compared to uh, fully symmetric uh, uh, states. Um, uh, or you can have non-equilibrium states, which are different from, from uh, which may belong to inequivalent representations compared to equilibrium states. 
and this is in a sense important in quantum computing curve space time because um, uh, if unless your curve space time has uh, static or stationary symmetry so a time like killing field you will not uh, even have a, a good notion of equilibrium states which is globally in, in equilibrium uh, so th this is Sorry, one can... motivation yeah. why a q of t uh, became an important point of view in q of t in curve space time Okay. Can I can I ask a quick question? Um, yeah. that, that seems a little uh, um, contradictory to, to what I see uh, what we see in physics. That um, um, it, it seems like you're saying that the uh, there's one algebra of observables, and and say in different vacua, uh, uh, it would just result in having different representation for the very same algebra of uh, observables. Is that for, is for that, the same uh, kind of dynamical? If you, if you have mm. a, a collection of fields and a dynamical law for it, then yeah, the same algebra observables with different representations could explain these different phenomena. Yeah. But but uh, those theories in different vacua they they usually look rather different from each other. Uh, how come it's always? Uh, I mean, that's a vague physical question. It's just that so, you know. So um, uh, the things that are observables that we extract as, as uh, uh, that we are going to compare to experiments from a quantum field theory are expectation values. So the observables that what I refer to here are operators and you need to take expectation values of them and their products to obtain things that could be compared to experiments, right? So sure. uh, it is these uh, expectation values that require states and that will depend on the representation. Right. So that will determine why the same algebra could uh, describe very different physical phenomena. Hmm. Okay. okay. So when I ask you what is typically this uh, from factor A, so uh, can I have bounded uh, operators on what? On L2 of U? Uh, well, you know, in, in once you accept this point of view of algebraic Q, Q of T, then you can build this algebra abstractly. And I'm not going to go into much detail here. But yeah, but uh, I'm asking whether there is actually some realization of it. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. So because I'm aware of some recent field on Minkowski space or a free fermionic field on uh, Minkowski space. And then, you know, you take these such objects, they form an algebra, and that's an example of this algebra. Often we have to enlarge it a bit, but that's, that would be an explicit example. So it is a closure of a C star algebra of... Uh, yeah, it could be. The infinity uh, U. Yeah, but that C star algebras are sometimes too, too restrictive because uh, uh, we want to be able to contain uh, un mm. unbounded operators in them. Mm. Okay, mm. so... It's not so important to dwell on the, on this point. Uh, so let me uh, go forward. All right. So in the framework of a Q of T, uh, we can do perturbation theory. All right. So how does this work? Uh, so um, if you consider an interaction interacting Lagrangian, right, which you can split in two parts, L zero would be a free Lagrangian, uh, and uh, uh, L i would be the interaction term, and lambda is a corresponding parameter. Uh, so we, we're going to suppose that we can build a free theory based on the free Lagrangian without any problems, right? That's kind of the basic assumption in going forward. Uh, and it satisfies all the, prop all the nice properties that we want. Uh, then uh, this uh, uh, interaction Lagrangian would be uh, something like an element of uh, these, this algebra of observables that belongs to free field algebra. Um, I'm already being a little bit um, imprecise here, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail uh, shortly. Uh, and uh, what we really want to do now is uh, start, start with the free fields and construct out of them interacting fields. Okay, so interacting fields are going to uh, form their own algebra. Uh, sorry, they're going to generate their own uh, algebra, but uh, we use the free algebra to contain the algebra generated by um, the interacting fields, okay? So the interacting fields are, are built out of uh, uh, free fields and observables sitting in the uh, algebra of the 
uh, of the free fields. And uh, the way to do it is to use or uh, so-called Bogolubov's, Bogolubov's formula, uh, which if you've taken a course in QFT, you probably recognize this, uh, maybe not immediately, but uh, to explain this, so, so this curly T for me is a so-called so uh, time ordering operator. So what it does is uh, uh, it, you know, it takes a, an argument. Uh, usually it has to be expanded in uh, formal power series in our coupling constant uh, lambda. And then uh, it's gonna be in possibly infinite sum of, of, of terms. Each term is going to be polynomial in the fundamental fields. Um, uh, 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 so, polynomial uh, in the fundamental fields localized at different space-time points and possibly uh, smeared with test functions over each of the space-time points, right? And uh, what the time ordering does is basically uh, uh, down at the level of products of fundamental fields localized at space-time points, it uh, uh, fully symmetrizes the quantum product uh, uh, as a function of, uh, sorry, uh, it orders the uh, uh, the products according to the chronological or causal order of the localizations of the uh, of the fundamental fields. Right. So uh, you're going to have a field localized at a point X here, a field localized at a point Y. Then you have the interacting Lagrangian, uh, which is going to be localized at another point, integrated over all points of, of M. And uh, so when you pass the time ordering through the different integrals until it contains just a product of uh, several localized fields and uh, say in, in, uh, some uh, copies of the interaction Lagrangian localized at different points, uh, it should be interpreted as the product of these uh, uh, objects ordered along uh, according to the causal order of the space time we're there, okay? Um, and uh, so th this formula is just, you know, it's motivated in, in textbooks. Uh, uh, th th this uh, should be interpreted as, uh, so these phi i's should be interpreted as interacting fields and this T uh, subscripted with the interaction Lagrangian should be thought of as a time ordering of the interacting fields, right? So if you have access to all these objects, then you basically have full access to the uh, so-called interacting theory. All right, uh, as, as I already mentioned, we are dealing with formal expansions in the uh, coupling uh, constant, right? So uh, to make that precise, uh, all we're doing is just working over uh, uh, formal power series in the coupling constant and also H bar. So that allows us to ignore convergence issues, which are in any case uns an unsolved problem in QFT in general. Uh, converges uh, with respect to expansions in the in the interaction constant. Uh, and uh, also uh, often what we'll do is uh, instead of treating lambda as, as just a constant, we'll replace it uh, by a test function. Okay, so that lambda would uh, generally have compact support. Uh, and what this does is it separates ultraviolet and infrared problems. So infrared problems come from uh, trying to take uh, integrals over non-compact space-time and sometimes they diverge. And uh, ultraviolet problems uh, are, come from when you try to take uh, integrals of things that diverge when uh, uh, the space-time points as their arguments uh, cl come close together. Okay, so we'll, uh, here we're dealing only with uh, potential UV problems and ignore all IR problems, although these are important things and, you know, there's ongoing work on how to deal them and incorporate them into this, this framework. All right, so the, what does it mean to try to make sense or, uh, of this Bogolubov formula? Well, if we had uh, the uh, uh, well-defined notion of time order products, which you know, would allow us to uh, make this formula well-defined, then we're done, okay? So this is what, where we're going to concentrate. Yeah. So what we need to do is to be able to define a time order product of uh, uh, say k or k plus one, um, in this case, uh, uh, localized uh, field observables. So space-time point localized field observables um, uh, for, for any k, right? If we can do it for any k, then any term that appears in this expansion makes sense 
and then and we're done. So the way that we want to interpret them uh, is be because remember, um, uh, we, we are in any case smearing with test functions over every uh, space time point that is located here, right? So we don't need this to be defined as an element of our algebra or the free field algebra. So this time order product need only be defined as a distribution, right? So it depends on a bunch of uh, space time points and it takes values in the free field algebra, right? So this is what, what sense we want to make of, of these objects, okay? Uh, and if these time ordered products are well defined, then using this formula, our interacting fields are well defined. Uh, you know, interacting time order products of interacting fields are well defined. Once we find representations for the algebras that we can build out of these things, then we can uh, get expectation values and, in principle, compare them to experiments and so on and so forth. All right. So, uh, how could we make sure that these time order products are well defined or how could we define it? Well, it turns out that the key observation for them is, uh, well, it's part of their definition, really. Um, so suppose that, uh, you know, you, you feed in K uh, objects into the time order product and you notice that one of them, say the one localized at X1, is chronologically later than the space-time arguments to all the other terms in this in this product. Well, by the time ordering property of the uh, of the of these of these uh, curly T's, well, we could now uh, take this uh, this factor a at x one outside, right, and use the the quantum product, right, in the algebra that we already have defined. Okay, uh, and uh, so this is something localized at point x1. Usually this is an operator value distribution. This is another thing which is localized at a different number of space-time points, which are different from x1. Uh, it is also a, uh, an operator valued uh, distribution. Uh, and we have a product of two operators here. So in principle, this is well defined, right? But this only works for certain uh, combinations of uh, these space-time localizations, okay? Um, when in particular when x1 is chronologically later than all the other arguments uh, if uh, say xk was chronologically earlier then we could do the same thing but put the big xk factor here instead okay well the uh, this ob observation uh, was uh, used by epstein glaser to actually almost completely uh, fix uh, the time order product uh, with uh, uh, so using induction, right? So if you uh, know the time order products for K minus one uh, terms, uh, and you use some, you know, the, the causal structure of uh, starting with Minkowski space, but the same argument also works in curved space times and some combinatorics, well, you can actually uh, make sure that the time order product for K uh, arguments is also well-defined for all combinations of the space-time points outside what we call the, uh, the small or thin diagonal, uh, outside uh, the, the, the diagonal where all the space-time points are actually equal, okay? Uh, now, th and this is where renormalization actually happens, okay? Because this is a distribution, right? It's now defined on M copies of Minkowski, uh, say Minkowski space, whatever space time you're working on, uh, sorry, K copies of the space time minus this small diagonal, okay? But we do expect the, uh, uh, this distribution to have singular behavior as the points all come towards each other and approach this thin diagonal, all right? And uh, uh, when you look at uh, UV divergences, there, uh, the, as they typically appear in quantum field theory in textbooks, uh, essentially they come from, from this singular behavior, right? So what we need to do now is to um, extend uh, this distribution from the, this, uh, these K copies of the space-time minus the thin diagonal to all of these you know, multiple copies of the, of the space-time. Because once that's done, then uh, the uh, you know the the k 
uh, argument time order product is defined. And then this perturbative expansion is defined basically up to order K, right? And if we then can do this for time order products of uh, K plus one arguments, this perturbative expansion is defined to order K plus one and so on and so forth, okay? So in the, this Epstein-Glauser approach, renormalization or UV renormalization just comes down to this operation of extending distribution from uh, uh, this, uh, you know, multiple copies of your space time minus the thin diagonal to, uh, to the thin diagonal. So, so now that it's defined every, on uh, all the tuples of points in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in this, this product of space times. And it turns out that this is actually always possible. Uh, you know, always have to qualify. Uh, you have to take, you know, reasonable examples and uh, of, of quantum field theories. And this is, you know, why people come up with these lists of axioms, right? So you come up with a list of axioms and for any quantum field theory that satisfies these axioms, you can do this, this extension. And just to, if you're not familiar with, you know, what this in extension entails, let me just give you a very elementary example. So suppose that you have uh, the real line and you remove zero, right? On this real line, you have perfectly well-defined function. So it's not even a distribution out, you know, on the points where it's defined. One over X, right? It's defined on the real line minus zero. Now, uh, there is an, a way to interpret this, this function as a distribution, but defined on the whole real line. And everybody knows uh, at least one example of doing this which is uh, use the, you know, I epsilon or I plus I zero prescription. Okay, so integration against one over X is interpreted as uh, complex integration by avoiding the pole at zero, you know, in, on one side of the uh, complex uh, plane. Uh, that's one way of doing it, but that's not the unique way of doing it. So you could have taken minus I zero here or some other Maybe you could take the principal value instead of this, uh, this prescription. Uh, but it turns out all possibilities are classified uh, uh, under, say, you know, keeping the same dimension uh, uh, of, of the distribution, um, so scaling dimension. Uh, the only thing you, you're able to do is to add uh, a delta function, right? Because uh, the delta function doesn't disturb the value of distribution anywhere outside uh, the the point x equals zero, uh, and the, the, but this delta function could have an arbitrary constant in front of it, right? So um, the ability to extend the distributions here uh, tells us that it is possible to do UV renormalization, uh, which is a, a, equivalent to doing infinite subtractions in kind of the textbook approach to UV renormalization. Uh, and uh, the ambiguity in, or the non-uniqueness in the different ways of doing the subtraction is character, characterized by uh, basically these extra localized distributional terms that could be added uh, to any one way of doing this. Okay. Yeah, sorry, but the C cannot be arbitrary. Yeah, so sorry? C, cannot, uh, C cannot be arbitrary if you speak about convergence in uh, fresh air or I don't know, Banach space. Well, I'm not talking about convergence. So C is one right. over two, or C is one over uh, four P two, uh, or pi two, or pi square. Oh, but I, I'm, I'm not but, talking about convergence in any specific way. So of this to that, right? So the, the whole point is that all I know uh, is uh, that I want some distribution that behaves like one over X outside X equals zero. And here's the list of exo that exhausts these possibilities. Uh, preserving the scaling dimension of, of the distribution. But the C is definite uh, number. Some no, C is a finite number. C number. characterizes the possibilities of doing this extension. Okay. All right. So now uh, there is a caveat to what I described. Uh, so if you look at what is the typical uh, interaction Lagrangian, uh, you will notice that, uh, say, in uh, lambda phi, phi four theory, uh, it is uh, uh, a nonlinear local uh, expression in terms of your fundamental field. So, uh, naively, you would try to define it as, you know, take your, uh, you know, fundamental field of operator value distribution uh, and uh, multiply it multiple times. Right? But uh, these are, since these are distributions in X. Uh, you can't just multiply them at the same value of x, right? Because of 
they are singular in nature, right? So this naive approach doesn't work, but you still want to have something that essentially plays the role of uh, phi to the fourth, uh, okay? Um, and th th this can be kind of fit into the framework that I, I was describing by um, noticing that you need something to start the Epstein-Glasser induction, right? If you want to define time order products of you know k arguments, you need to know what they are for k minus one arguments, and this is basically referring to the problem of you know how to decide what are the you know t one time orderings uh, uh, of uh, so quote unquote time orderings uh, of your um, uh, of, of your fundamental object fundamental fields, um, and uh, once you think about it, uh, the, the the way that makes more sense is to think of t one as a map from uh, local, possibly nonlinear classical expressions in your field to something that lives in the free quantum algebra or the quantum algebra of the free, free quantum field. And uh, this may be an unfamiliar notation to, to think of time order products of, of a single argument, but really uh, in, in literature, it's more often called something like weak ordering right? or, or uh, weak, weak powers. Right, so this, 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 these notions are equivalent. So what, what we need to do now to be able to start the Epstein-Glasser induction is to define these, uh, this weak ordering of uh, local classical uh, observables. And uh, uh, you've probably you know, seen in textbooks how this can be done. There are different definitions. Uh, so in Minkowski space, uh, you can do things like uh, you know, when you uh, define your your fields. Uh, you impose a uh, momentum cutoff, uh, and when you you know so that you can actually define these products uh, with the cutoff there. So this is well defined in terms of the operator products. Uh, but then you need to subtract something which depends on the cutoff, uh, which goes to infinity as a cut of go cut off goes to infinity, and such that this difference is uh, remains finite. And the the way uh, that is usually done is that people say, okay, well, let's take this, this product, uh, make sure that all the um, uh, creation operators are uh, on, the, on the left, all the annihilation operators are, are on the right, and whatever, there's going to be some scalar thing that's left over here, and this is what we're going to subtract. Um, An equivalent way of doing this is noticing that the, this kind of subtraction um, does not necessarily require a moment of cutoff, but could be done using point splitting. Okay, so you take the product of these operator value distributions at different space-time points, and this is well defined for for as a distribution of products. Um, but now you take the expectation value with respect to your vacuum state, and we are very lucky in Minkowski space we have a preferred point coordinate invariant, a so-called Fock vacuum. Uh, so it could be done for any uh, operators, and uh, uh, you basically just subtract this. Okay, so you subtract this, and it turns out that uh, it gives you the same result uh, as with the momentum cutoff subtraction. Uh, so this is well defined as as uh, so this difference is well defined as you let the two spacetime arguments go to the same point. Uh, the same prescription can be uh, in a more complicated way can be uh, extended to higher powers of of the fundamental fields. Okay, great. So uh, on curved spacetime in general, there is no momentum space or no momentum space type approach. Uh, but uh, you can do the point splitting. So the point splitting still works in curved space times. But here's the problem. Uh, in Minkowski space, we had a preferred vacuum state uh, to be able to do the subtraction. Uh, <clears throat> um, if you take some arbitrary state, which could, for example, belongs to a different uh, representation, uh, which uh, is not equivalent to the representation where, where the Poincaré Fock, uh, uh, Fock vacuum lives, then uh, you could have a very different uh, quantity here with very different singular behavior, right? And it's not guaranteed that this difference would, would actually be well defined. Uh, uh, so uh, the problem in curved space time is that there is no such candidate uh, state that you can associate to a, an arbitrary curved space time such that you can do this subtraction so that it's well-defined um, uh, for, for all the operators that you want to weak order. 
However, this problem was eventually solved by noticing that even though there's no one preferred state for a given space-time, there's a preferred class of states, uh, which are called Adamar states. Okay, and uh, they're characterized essentially by I mean, there are different ways of characterizing them, but one way of characterizing them is uh, like this. So, if you take the Hadamard state and you take the expectation value of say this this uh, two point product of, of fundamental fields, then the leading singular part uh, will have to be uh, scalar proportional to the scalar. Uh, uh, and depend only on the local geometry of the space-time and the location of these points x, y. Okay, it should not depend on the state itself as long as it's in the Hadamard class. Of course, you can have then uh, less singular, sub-singular uh, lower order terms, uh, which could depend on the state, right? So all the state dependence goes into these sub-singular terms, right? So, uh, and this, this uh, quantity h of x, y is sometimes called the Hadamard parametrics. Uh, and because it's defined, uh, uh, depends only on the local geometry, you can use it without a reference to the state. Okay, you can do the subtraction uh, and uh, appropriately generalize it to higher powers of, of phi. And this way you can define weak ordering uh, with respect to the Hadamard parametrics on an arbitrary curve space time in a locally covariant way. All right. Okay, so this is where weak ordering on uh, curve space time uh, comes in. All right. Uh, so, uh, short summary of uh, what uh, uh, I've, I've told you about uh, perturbative a AQFT. Uh, so, it perhaps it it's in, uh, worth stating one of the main results of the uh, um, that um, so. Uh, in that you can achieve in this framework. So, of course, everything depends on the kind of hypothesis you put in, right? So there's some, you know, axioms under which we can use this approach. Uh, but as long as these axioms are satisfied, which, you know, for common examples of, you know, free scalar, spinner, and tensor fields, uh, uh, they, they are usually satisfied. Um, so the theorem is that there exist a way to define these time order products, okay? So if you can construct a free quantum field that satisfies our, our uh, you know, re uh, requirements, then you can always build these renorm renormalized time order products, and that means you can build interacting fields, okay? Moreover, if uh, you can define this, these renormalized time order products in two different ways that still satisfy all the list of requirements that, that uh, we give it, then the difference between them can actually be absorbed by so-called finite renormalizations. And this is, this is the, uh, it, it, so me finally getting to uh, one of the subjects of the, of the talk, right? So what are finite renormalizations? Well, they are uh, order H bar, corrections uh, to uh, your uh, two elements of your um, uh, free field algebra, uh, which generate corrections to uh, the interaction Lagrangian and also generate corrections to uh, the uh, uh, actual observables that we're trying to, uh, uh, to compute. Okay, so basically, if you have two ways to construct time order products, uh, then the interacting time order products of interacting uh, field operators uh, with respect to the T prime are the same as the interacting uh, time order products of slightly corrected order H bar corrected um, ob observables uh, with a slightly or order H bar corrected interaction. Okay. And all of these corrections are finite uh, within our, our framework, right? So this is why they're called finite renormalizations. These are the degrees of freedom in renormalization left after taking care of so-called infinite renormalizations, which are needed to define these uh, time order products in the first place. Okay, and- no, Sorry, I can imagine that- uh, The main theorem of perturbative renormalization. So question- I can imagine that this theorem uh, is uh, really difficult 
but uh, I'm sorry. Yeah? So when um, or when analyzing it, yeah? so free QFT means uh, this lambda, uh, this Lagrangian uh, is zero, the first yeah. part. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But then you speak about uh, lambda interacting. Uh, yeah, it doesn't contradict itself. Yeah. No. So uh, if you go back to this uh, Bogoluba formula, uh, sorry, going the wrong way. Here, right? Yes. So th this is the this is the formula that defines these time interacting time order products of your uh, interacting fields. Okay, mm -hmm. but these are all built out of things that live in the free field algebra. Right? So these are free fundamental fields, and this is the interaction term built out of free fields. Mm -hmm. So I don't uh, understand the nomenclature. Yeah. Sorry for that. Yeah. So oh, yeah. no, no problem. free field doesn't mean that uh, I don't consider uh, lambda i zero. Doesn't uh, no, but free field is your starting point, which you want to use to construct interacting fields. In by making sense of this of this formula, so that's that's all it is. That seems somehow crucial, eh? but <laughs> yes, of course, <laughs> it's not easy, as you said, but <laughs> it can be done. Uh, okay, so I think this is a, a kind of a great success. And, yeah, but uh, 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 second question would be uh, who yeah. proved it? Yeah, this, uh, yes, that's a good question. Uh, and, uh, there's is no it? single person that can be pointed to, <laughs> because the thing is, uh, so you know, there there's some ancestors of, of this result that, uh, you know, li lived in the kind of more informal physics literature or yeah. less, less precise physics literature or more limited in scope uh, literature. So one version of this, uh, you know, uh, can be proven within the so-called DPH set renormalization approach. Okay. Uh, but it, the, the context of the modern formulation of this is, is larger, right? It's not limited to that particular renormalization approach. Um, uh, so uh, I think Klaus Hepp may, may have been one of the first people to formulate a result like this uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, the, here, here are some references that contain uh, precise uh, and uh, detailed expositions of what, what I've just described to you. Uh, so I recommend that you look some of them up and uh, um, look for the yeah uh, so not not all of so th this this is a, a book that collects a bunch of chapters uh, including one by yours truly if you like um uh so some of them might mention the main theorem uh and then you find uh, also find other papers that specifically talk about the main theorem but you know to be able to read all of this stuff you know it's it's, it's helpful to have some surveys on on hand all right, so what, what do I can be contained also in the book of uh, Reisner, of Reisner. Yeah, there's more, yeah, there's more literature on this by now. Very right up to date. Sure, yeah. Uh, so there's, uh, th this is just one example of, 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 uh, of, uh, of uh, source material. Uh, there, there are some more by now. Okay. So as, as I said, I think that it's, it's important to know about, about this framework and this kind of result uh, because I, uh, it provides a, a precise framework uh, or way to talk about the kind of quantum field theory you find in, in a graduate physics textbook, right? So, so there people still use cutoffs, uh, you know, uh, they use imprecise language uh, and this can be confusing to many people and not everybody knows that you can find uh, mathematically precise versions of the calculations and constructions that you can find in uh, graduate level quantum field theory textbooks. Okay, and uh, there's probably more than one framework that, that can make them mathematically precise, but this, at least this is one of them. Uh, one, another key feature is that there's no need for uh, Euclidean weak rotation in any of this discussion. Okay, we're working directly in real space time. Uh, maybe this is also a drawback because some things that are possible with weak rotation 
uh, would would not there's no way to to use it utilize it in here or no no obvious way of, of doing this and uh, so another feature is that uh, all of this discussion doesn't really rely doesn't rely on path integrals in any way uh, again it could be a drawback if you really love path integrals you will not find them here okay uh, but you also don't need them uh, because they all introduce an extra layer of kind of mathematical fuzziness okay so i know that i've been oh, going already. i'm very sorry uh igor i'm interested in that yeah so yes. uh... <laughs> Uh, let me ask you, uh, what, what does it mean finite in this case? You, this big OH means yeah. some infinity? So it just means that from... it's uh, uh, H bar. Mm -hmm. Right, so, uh, so uh, OH, yeah. H bar, just means it's H bar times uh, something which lives in you know your algebra of your free field that's all it is h to the power of one yeah no yeah no, so no, it no, starts no, we no. could have other things that have h in it but it's it starts at the uh, h power to the power one no, okay uh all right Sorry, so question uh, Sorry. yes uh, do the corrections to AI BI depend on AI BI or, or not? Yes, of course, they depend on. So these corrections are, they depend on the observable that's being corrected. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you can phrase it as a kind of uh, um, linear map from the algebra to itself. Well, sorry, not, not linear, uh, possibly nonlinear map from the algebra to itself. Okay. So uh, in the last maybe, 10, 15 minutes, if, if I'm allowed. <laughs> uh, maybe I can I can get a bit further, a bit or a bit closer to uh, uh, to my own contributions to, to the topic. Uh, but first, I want to uh, discuss a, a bit the the uh, importance or role of these finite renormalizations. Okay, why is it important to know them and classify them and so on and so forth? Well, one important motivation is when they're pitted against anomalies, okay? Um, so just a, a short comment, um, even if when you're not dealing with uh, uh, quantum field theory, just in ordinary quantum mechanics, right? You have to, um, uh, when you quantize a classical system, you have to find a way of uh, associating quantum observables to classical ones, okay? Uh, and there's no natural unique way to do this a priori. So if you find one way of doing it, why not take a different way, which you know basically adds these uh, order h bar corrections to it? All right. And these corrections or ambiguities are precisely the the finite renormalizations that that uh, I I mentioned. Um, well, so having them around can be actually useful because you know if you quantize a classical system that has symmetries or you know maybe it has conservation laws or some other features that you want to be preserved at the quantum level uh, you might not be so lucky to be able to you know preserve them right away so you you quantize them but maybe some symmetry classical symmetry is not preserved at the quantum level uh, you know it, it's said in that case that the symmetry is anomalous or you had some conservation law like energy conservation uh, that is somehow violated uh, in the quant after quantization Okay, so that's also called an anomaly. Well, maybe you can find one of these finite renormalizations, uh, which uh, is such that it restores the symmetry or restores the conservation law. Okay, so that uh, you know you already working at the level of the, the quantum system, right? You don't need to go once again through you know extended distributions or subtracting infinities. So you work already at the well defined. Uh, quantum level. Uh, and uh, to be able to answer such questions, you need to know what are the precise freedoms that you have in finite renormalizations. All right. So this is important. This is why it's important to uh, analyze them. At least one reason uh, is to be able to decide when upon quantization, you can 
cancel some potential anomalies. Uh, and uh, you know, on curve space time, there are you know a bunch of questions that come up. You know, how does this depend on the, the vacuum state uh, that you choose on curve space time? So these these finite randomizations. You know, what precise way are they local? Um, uh, how can they be defined? Can they be defined in a covariant way? Uh, how much more ambiguity is there in curve space time compared to Minkowski space time, and so on. All right. So here's an example. I just think of QFT on Minkowski space. Everything is point current variant. We have nice Falk vacuum. We have a prescription for weak products uh, using vacuum subtraction. Fine. Okay. But maybe that prescription is somehow anomalous, right? What can we do to get rid of those anomalies? Well, turns out that for higher weak powers, uh, you can, in, in fact, add uh, a subleading uh, weak. So you, you want to uh, you know, uh, do a finite renormalization of a, a weak power phi to the k. Well, you can add power, powers of phi uh, lower than k with some coefficients. OK, I mean, in a sense, this is uh, no worse than what you did originally. And perhaps you can choose the coefficients uh, in such a way to cancel some anomalies that, that, that came up. Well, what are these z's? Uh, well, they have to be constrained uh, by all the properties of the quantum field period we want to keep. Uh, point current invariance, you know, the, somehow they should not uh, uh, disturb the uniqueness of the Falk vacuum. They shouldn't really change the uh, scaling dimensions of the fields. They should preserve other symmetries which are not anomalous, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, they basically have to be constants. That's what it comes down to. Uh, and uh, uh, if you know, you can look at some examples. Uh, so you take uh, the, these these type of uh, weak ordered operators, and uh, you see what kind of corrections you can add to them. And it turns out that uh, because of, uh, in particular, because of constraints by the scaling dimension of your field, there are only finitely many terms that you can add. Uh, and uh, also allowing dependence on other parameters in your theory that like, like a mass, which itself has, has dimensions. Oh, so that's very nice, right? So you have a finite dimensional uh, space of finite renormalizations that you can add. And if you need to decide whether you can cancel some anomaly, it becomes a kind of a, a linear Finite dimensional linear algebra problem. Very nice. Okay, so um, uh, now we would like to be able to answer the same kind of questions in Q of T and curve space time. So now I have to be ultra brief, and I'll just say that there exists a framework for doing a so-called locally covariant uh, perturbative A Q of T on curve space time. Okay, uh, so this was axiomatized uh, by a number of people in the early 2000s. Um, it involves some category theory. So the, this association of algebras to space-time regions can be thought of uh, as, uh, with, you know, with a metric on them in this, in this particular case, uh, can be thought of as a, a functorial assignment. And this functor uh, from space-time regions or space-times to algebras needs to satisfy, satisfy some properties like this monotonicity, uh, which I mentioned before, uh, space-like space -like commutativity or micro-causality, uh, time-slice property, which uh, means basically your, uh, your Q of T has to have well-posed um, it, it has to satisfy equations with the well-posed initial value problem, and so on and so forth. Okay, but there is a framework that we can use to study this question precisely. All right. So the freedom in uh, uh, classifying, uh, so the classification and the freedom of finite renormalizations of weak products has already been looked at kind of long ago by people, you know, in uh, were you know responsible partly for fun founding this subject. Okay. Uh, so they they. Uh, uh, but they did it in a limited way, in a sense, uh, with some caveats. So, for example, they just studied the scalar free scalar field uh, uh, of this type, and then they said, like, well, you can generalize it for uh, uh, vector valued fields, for forms, for spinners, and so on. But they didn't actually do it. Okay, uh, and uh, they needed to impose some technical conditions. Uh, but the result was quite nice. Okay, the result said that 
uh, okay, if you have two prescriptions for weak powers of, of the scalar field, uh, then the difference between them is a, a combination of lower weak powers with scalar coefficients. And these scalar coefficients uh, depend locally on the metric and other parameters in, in your theory, right? So mass and the curvature coupling. Uh, so the uh, dependence has to be very specific. Uh, it uh, is a polynomial in, so it could depend on derivatives of, of the metric, but not arbitrary in an arbitrary way. It depends on the metric through the Riemann curvature tensor, possibly its covariant derivatives and, and so on. Uh, and uh, these things have to be polynomially put together in a covariant way, uh, depending polynomially on the mass and an analytic way on this parametric C. Wait a second. Why analytic? Well, <laughs> because, I mean, we're talking about smooth space times. Where does, a, a, you know, there's nothing specifically analytic of, with what we started with, but it turns out that they imposed a certain technical condition that, uh, in, that, that there's a kind of analyticity sitting in the hypothesis uh, of, of uh, the kind of uh, um, re renormalized quantum fields that we're talking about. Okay, and to to myself and and my quarters, it seemed a bit unnatural. Uh, for for some reasons, uh, I won't go into this because I'm I'm already running out of time. Uh, but basically, having an analytic condition uh, in the middle of a theory that's basically lives in a smooth world uh, is not very natural, right? So we thought that maybe there's a way to uh, avoid this, and at the same time maybe kind of simplify and understand the proof of Hollands and Wald in more, in more detail, uh, because their proof was quite complicated. And part of the complication was the, their use of this analyticity hypothesis. Uh, so essentially, the complication was responsible for the fact that uh, even though the original work was back in 2001, uh, when we started looking at this in uh, around 2013, 2014, uh, basically, no progress has been done. So, uh, uh, generalizing this their their proof to other kinds of fields and uh, so slightly other different contexts has not been done by that point. All right. So we thought. Yeah, that... I understand. I understand it, but uh, actually, can you uh, can you uh, can you uh, somehow map uh, or connect the analyticity to the analysis uh, analyticity of the S metrics? Uh, no, it's a different kind. No, really different. Really different. Similarly by approach, but okay. No, uh, yeah, there's no relation. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. All right. So uh, I will skip this this part because uh, I don't have time to uh, to go into this. All right. So now I'm getting closer to actually describing our results. So here I'm describing the hypothesis under which we're working. So we are basically listing the axioms that the weak products should satisfy, and they're very reasonable axioms, and we believe that you know they are the right ones. Um, so uh, this you know the weak ordering of the fundamental field is a fundamental field itself. You want to preserve commutation relations, at least when uh, one of the arguments in a commutator is a fundamental field, and he here you have a weak power maybe of higher order. Uh, this is in general impossible to do if you want to preserve, um, uh, you know, translate the, the quantum commutator into the classical Poisson bracket for arbitrary arguments. But if you if one of the arguments is just a fundamental field, then this can be done. Um, uh, this is a technical condition. Completeness just means that, you know, uh, there are no other we're dealing with a case where phi contains all the fundamental fields. It's not like we're dealing with an algebra that's generated by phi and other fundamental fields. So that's that's captured by the completeness condition. We want to impose um, a preservation of uh, scaling degrees or so-called mass dimensions. So the uh, of the metric of the fundamental fields and any other background fields that are involved in 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 the in the theory. Uh, up to possibly logarithmic corrections. So we say, okay, logarithmic corrections are, are kind of okay to scaling dimensions. And instead of where, so here there would be uh, in the list of axioms of Hollands and Wald, uh, Hollands and Wald, there would be an analyticity condition. So, so, uh, so Hollands and Wald required that the, the weak products 
uh, would depend on the metric analytically, but not necessarily for all metrics, at least for analytic metrics. There's a very kind of strange condition if you phrase it. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we wanted to, to, to get rid of it. So what we have instead is that uh, for uh, the, our smoothness condition is that uh, expectation values of weak ordered products in other more states uh, have to be smooth uh, in uh, space time and uh, you know uh, with respect to variations of the background um, metric and other background fields that enter in, into the theory. Okay, very good. So uh, there's some other requirements with you know that are typically uh, listed, but they're not used in our proof. So I'll, I'll skip them. Um, a small condition, uh, because we are dealing, we're now working at the level of kind of higher generality than uh, than Holmes and Wall did. So we uh, don't need to work with a single scalar field. We can work with multiplet of of any kind of bosonic fields, uh, multi-component fields, and we can have uh, background fields that are not just the metric, not just the the mass, not just the curvature coupling, but any other um, uh, background. Uh, uh, scalars or, or tensors that enter the Lagrangian. Uh, but under such generality, we have to restrict ourselves in some way. And it turns out that we have to restrict the scaling dimensions of the background fields in this particular way. Again, I won't go into precise details uh, of what, what this means, but basically this, this uh, admissibility condition is satisfied for, you know, we check for all, all the usual fields that, that uh, background fields that enter the Lagrangian. So mass, it's okay. Uh, curvature company is okay, metric is okay, and you know other examples are also also electric charge also will be okay, and so on. Okay, very good. Um, and finally, so this is the the theorem that that we proved in uh, our work with uh, Walter Moretti and and later with Alberto Milazzi. Uh, so suppose that you know we have this list of axioms satisfied by our, our weak products. Of, of quantum fields. Uh, if we find two uh, weak orderings that satisfy all our properties, that we know that the difference between them is very constrained. And it's constrained to be of the following type. So again, it's a, a sum of uh, weak products of uh, lower order with coefficients. And uh, these coefficients are now you know, could be tensor valued because our, uh, uh, or vector valued because our um, fields are now multi-component. So we have to take care of, you know, some index combinatorics here. So this is a specific way of doing this. Then these, these coefficients, right, they're, um, uh, so they're, they're C numbers, so they're not quantum operators, but they depend on the background metric and uh, any other background tensor fields uh, in a local way. Uh, they preserve mass dimension or scaling degree. Um, and the local dependence is once again constrained uh, to be polynomial uh, in uh, the curvature tensor. So uh, depending on the metric through the curvature tensor and its covariant derivatives. So dependence on these background tensor fields through them and their covariant derivatives. And these are polynomial expressions, uh, you know, covariantly contracted possibly with uh, the metric and uh, the volume form uh, if, if needed. Uh, and then there are some other scalar coefficients and the scalar coefficients themselves uh, now depend only on a subset of the background fields. Those that uh, had, uh, uh, zero scaling dimension. So we saw this uh, requirement of admissibility. So if, if you have an equal sign here, it's basically uh, we're talking about a um, background uh, field that is uh, uh, in our terminology marginal. So for example, like the curvature coupling was, uh, was marginal. Uh, so it, um, the background fields appear polynomially in everything except these scalar coefficients where now, uh, the dependence on them uh, has to be smooth. So before, Hollins and Wald had a result about analytic dependence on the curvature coupling. But here, in, in our result, 
we end up with a smooth dependence on marginal background fields, which include the curvature coupling. Okay, so this is our uh, main result. And uh, I'm already short on time, I think. So I should probably stop here. But on the way to stopping, I will very quickly li li leaf through some remarks on, on the proof. Uh, so just so you have an idea of how this, is, uh, uh, this was achieved and what was used in it. Right? So uh, there's some kind of commutator combinatorics that you can use to fix the general form of the, these finite renormalizations. Okay, which are similar to what Holmes and Wald had. Uh, then the locality properties, this you know functorial locality that I mentioned before, uh, can be used to say, aha, these coefficients have to depend at most on, like on these background fields uh, uh, in, uh, locally. Okay, locally in a very precise sense that uh, if you feed in a germ of uh, these background fields, then the result depends only on that germ. Well, it turns out that under our conditions, this is enough to say that, ah, this is actually differential operator. Okay. And there's a nice theorem from differential geometry that allows us to do that. And one of the contributors to that theorem was Jan Slovak, who some of you know, so just a small remark. All right, so once we know that this is differential operator, it has to be invariant. And now you have, you have to use some invariant theory of representations of uh, the general linear group uh, and of the, uh, of the metric. So it turns out that uh, these invariants have to be covariant combinations of uh, Riemann curvature tensor and its covariant derivatives and the background tensor fields and their covariant derivatives with respect to the metric. Uh, then you uh, can um, uh, make some remarks about how the scaling dimension of this of this quantity, uh, which uh, um, basically requires you to have polynomial dependence on on any argument whose scaling dimension is not zero, right? And with respect to the rest of the arguments, which are the marginal ones, it's going to be smooth, and that's how you end up with our classification. Uh, okay, so here's an example. Uh, we're starting with uh, again with scalar field theory uh, as, as Holmes and Wald did. Uh, but now we can, we can uh, precisely classify uh, uh, finite renormalizations of more kinds of terms. So we can classify uh, uh, you know, finite renormalizations of uh, weak products involving derivatives of the fields. And their original result did not have that uh, stated explicitly. So we can just you know, list all of the possibilities explicitly. So it's still finite dimensional space. Uh, would up to these uh, coefficients that smoothly depend on the curvature coupling, which is which is marginal. Uh, and here's an example that uh, could not be considered uh, with the methods of uh, Holmes and Wald at all, because we're dealing with a uh, vector field, uh, so it's a massive vector field uh, satisfying massive Klein-Gordon equation. And we can do the same thing. We can do, do uh, a precise characterization of the finite renormalizations of the weak products of, of these uh, fundamental vector fields. All right. Uh, there's some interesting non trivial invariant theory, uh, smooth invariant theory that goes into this, by the way. Uh, okay. So I'm kind of out of time, I, be I believe. So I'll stop here and I'll let you read the, the conclusion slide if, if you like. All right, uh, thank you very much uh, for this very clear presentation. So, thank you. Yeah, I understand it, but from an analytical point of view, it's uh, everything something like uh, nonsense. Yeah? So, uh, where, <laughs> do you, where do you solve uh, the Klein Gordon equation for, uh, on distributions, on analytic, on polynomials? On analytical so, um, the thing that we need from the Klein-Gordon equation. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I meant the previous one. Not the very last slide. Example. I meant the previous one. Thank you. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, so it depends on the domains, yeah. So, <clears throat> so to so to say. So uh, maybe we just need some space. Hardly depends. Yes. So the main thing that you need for the Klein-Gordon equation. 
yeah. is uh, you need the uh, the green function. So yeah, I have it on compact manifold, maybe, uh, or, or or on R4 or R4. Wait. Uh, let's see. This this P operator is the Klein-Gordon equation, right? So I need a green function. Yeah. Uh, satisfying the usual. Mm. And I want this green function to have either retarded or advanced uh, support. Yeah, OK. So actually, when I suppose that the people know uh, uh, green functions for elliptic operators, so yeah. P is not elliptic in this case. No. So we have something. To hyperbolic. Yeah. So we have something uh, at our disposal, what is called the Ries distribution. Yeah. So Ries distribution. Mm -hmm. I mean, this are, are uh, modified uh, space. Yes. Yeah. So we have this, and um, I know it only superficially. We know we have it on R four on or R one three R one three. We maybe have it on many faults. Uh, yes. Yeah, by this uh, not so old results. All right. So okay. so the main thing. So I don't know. Do we have it on many faults globally yet? No. So. Uh, this it depends on the initial values also yeah so g exists hmm. when uh, this manifold mg hmm. hmm. is globally hyperbolic yeah yeah okay and that's all you need <laughs> so yeah. the rest is kind of automatic hmm. There's, there's a very nice book by uh, Bear. And we have solution, sorry, we have solution on uh, distributions with compact supports on this D, if I remember well. Uh, and they are, all, and they are maybe in C infinity, I don't know. It. Uh, well, okay. What, uh, so what, once you sorry have for the that, yes, it's maybe too specific. This, this is a, a, a distribution with some nice properties. Uh, yeah. You can use the, you can use it to solve an inhomogeneous problem with uh, different kinds of right hand side. It could be um, smooth compact support, could be distribution with compact support, could be an arbitrary smooth function, mm -hmm. uh, could be even arbitrary distribution. So all of these cases, the solutions exist. Are treated already? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it doesn't depend so much on the domain. <laughs> Well, it needs, so these space, space times have to be globally hyperbolic. That's the main condition. Yeah. So globally hyperbolic, then I solve it, for example, on the distributions with compact support. Sure. The, yeah. the star. Mm -hmm. I can get solution which is uh, not a function. Yeah, it will be distribution. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as I was saying, there's, there's a very nice book okay, by yes. Bear, Genou, and Pfeffle yeah, that, uh, uh, that covers it. the existence of these green functions. I had it a couple years ago. OK. OK, thanks. Can I ask a very speculative question? Yes, yes, of course. So, so when talking about this curved space time, like how, uh, how general, like what kind of wild space times you can have? Because there, 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 there is, I mean, you can, it cannot be anything, right? There is some, like, at least the time ordering has to be well defined and, and things yeah, like yeah. this. Yeah, so all of that uh, is, is, uh, is fine as long as you're in a globally hyperbolic space time. So globally hyperbolic, I mean, you can define it in different ways, but basically, uh, it's the same class of space times where you can have a Cauchy surface. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So I, I have a question about these um, uh, these correction terms. Yeah. Uh, so do symmetries of the of the Lagrangian kind of propagate to to these uh, differential operators C K? So what I mean is, is for example, if you take a massless equation, mm -hmm. 
then it's conformally invariant. So mm -hmm. maybe you want to expect that this CK will be also be conformally invariant or, or covariant or that they will kind of preserve this extra symmetry. Is, is that the case or could you look at that? Uh, so that's not automatic. Uh, and uh, in fact, with conformal symmetries, you often have these, uh, um, uh, these anomalies that uh, appear in the quantum theory. But I cannot tell you for sure whether, you know, in some particular case, they, they can be, uh, so the conformal sym symmetry can be kept or, or not. Uh, so what, what our result allows us to say is, is that, right, so all these, these finite renormalizations, all these coefficients will have this form, uh, provided that the weak ordering satisfies the, uh, the properties that, that I listed here. But notice that it does not require um, a pre preserving, as, as you asked, uh, uh, any extra symmetries of the Lagrangian other than uh, local covariance. So for example, even in the case when you are um, uh, on, um, uh, so suppose that your Lagrangian is invariant with respect to a, a parity inversion. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the thing that is not invariant under parity inversion is the, the epsilon tensor, the, vol the, the volume form. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so, in principle, these these the these corrections they can depend on the epsilon, okay, uh, and they might uh, be non-invariant under changes of sign of the epsilon. Okay, but if you want to require uh, that the corrections are also invariant under parity inversion, then you just say, okay, well, let me look at all these terms and I throw out all the ones that uh, change sign when epsilon changes sign. Right. So with conformal symmetry, you would pl play the same game, right? So now you know all of them, and it's precisely why we took this theorem. So you could do this kind of analysis, right? You know all of them. Let's see which ones of them are invariant under conformal transformations. And maybe you'll be in a situation where you don't have enough of them. So that, you know, um, every... Uh, so, so maybe, maybe this this phi, sorry, this weak ordering, is um, uh, not conformally invariant, right? And okay, fine. so then you want to ask the question: Can I correct it to make it conformally invariant? Well, then you look at the terms here. Okay, you need some conformally invariant terms, sorry, conformally non-invariant terms that will cancel the conformal non-invariants of your original weak ordering, and uh, so so that the result is invariant. Okay, and then you just test, right? You see, is it possible? And sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not possible. Right, thank you. Um... Maybe a slightly related question about these mm -hmm. Hadamard states. Um, so is it is it correct that this Hadamard state, when you, um, when you just look at the Minkowski space, is the same as the Fox state? Uh, well, so Hadamard uh, states, I mean, it's a class, right? So you, um, so cer certainly the Poincaré Fox, Fox uh, vacuum is Hadamard, uh, but also or any term, any state belonging to the same representation, right? Belonging to the usual Fox space is mm -hmm. Hadamard itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, there, there are also Hadamard states so there's a very nice result that says that if your space-time has compact Cauchy surface, so it's spatially compact, then uh, all Hadamard states belong to the same representation. Uh, I think and and now we are talking about representation of SO or of what the representation of your infinite-dimensional uh, algebra of of uh, quantum ah. observables. So. <laughs> of, of okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but if you are in a non-compact space-time, like Minkowski is non, especially non-compact, uh, mm -hmm. then th there are some inequivalent classes, but uh, that are still Hadamard, uh, uh, but there's a more a finer relation between them. So like basically they're, they're um, um, well, okay, I don't want to say something like really incorrect. So uh, okay, okay yeah. thank you. 
Uh, so maybe last question. Um, yeah. This main theorem of, of uh, this uh, pertub these perturbations, um, is it possible to, to kind of interpret it within some kind of algebraic deformation theory? Um, in a sense, yes. Uh, because, so yeah, what, what is it that we are looking at here? Well, we're looking at these time order products. Mm -hmm. and, in this, and they satisfy a list of axioms. So they're kind of algebraic structure. Yeah. So these finite renormalizations are the allowed deformations of this, of this algebraic structure. So but are you? I don't know if this is a precisely useful way of looking at it. Maybe it is. Okay. So so you are not aware of, of any work that would uh, that would try to treat this this topic from this point of view. Uh, no, no, no. Okay. I've I've you know had some vague thoughts about it, but uh, myself, but no, there's nothing really. Uh, specifically about that. Okay, thank you. By Maybe the way, I... you were... sorry. sorry. Uh, uh, you were first, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I will have a question from the uh, very beginning of of your talk, Igor. Yeah. Uh, I always uh, wondering how uh, we can. Um, um, honestly uh, say there is a time ordering operator on distributions since uh, we are not allowed to input uh, any space time point into the distribution right so mm -hmm. what's what's the um, uh, proper definition of the um, time order operator or ordering ordering operator. Um, so because, I mean, this is mm -hmm. this is related to the, the this this problem that um, using this this rule of you know factoring out uh, you know some some localized uh, object which uh, you know is chronologically later than everything else. Um, uh, it, th this operation, so here we are indeed multiplying two distributions, right? A of x1 is a distribution okay. in x1, and this is a distribution in all the other co coordinates. Um, and the, this is, turns out to be well-defined. So, so of course, you can take products of distributions that depend on different arguments, right? I hope you agree. It's a uh, it's kind of convolution of a operation. Well, just like, uh, you know, so why, why is it that you know, delta in two dimensions oh. is actually okay. equal to the product of delta of x times uh, delta of y, right? If you have, you know, x, y as your coordinates. Yeah. You, know, you can take products of distributions mm -hmm. in that way. Okay. Uh, so, right. So you can you can do this, and the same thing you can do here. So uh -huh. this is well defined, but that only gets you so far as to have this defined on this um, this this limited domain. So this is projective have... tensor product or injective projective probably. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe injective. Oh, no. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Uh, I think distributions uh, are nuclear space, so the both tensor products are the same. No, they are not nuclear. They're not? Okay, then then don't take what I say. It depends a bit. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. It, uh, from, um, yeah, so I was just going to say that, you know, this this is precisely the root of the problem. Uh, why we end up with this these time order products, you know, using this naive rule defined only on uh, uh, this this multiple copies of, of space time minus the thin diagonal. So in fact, uh, it it could be that uh, the the problem, the problematic set would be even larger. The the lar it could be the large diagonal where any two points coincide, not not all of them. 
together coincide. But yes. Epstein Glaser actually solved that problem. So this they so, showed. So, so this this ob observation some, somehow resolved the problem with uh, uh, the the um, multi or inputting uh, one particular point of um, space time into into some dis distribution. If I uh, understand it right. So I'm not sure. So now I'm not sure if I really answered your question. So of course I agree that plugging in a space-time point into a distribution and expecting to get like a, a, a real number or an, a specific operator value, it's impossible. And this is not what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. We're interpreting this factor as a distribution valued in operators. This is also distribution valued in operators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We're I see. Taking a product of distributions, mm -hmm. right? And for that to be possible, they need to have different arguments, and in fact, they do have different arguments here. Okay, I, I think uh, it, it answers. Okay. My my question. So, can you please go back to to the to your main result about these polynomials? Yes. Yeah. Um, it's just. A, Quick question: Is there some some bound on the degree? Is degree oh, k? Or? The degree of uh, sorry, w w degree of what? Because you can have differential yeah. degree, you can, you can have polynomial degree. Um, I mean, I guess I, I would just sum these two. Like, uh, do you have some some you know? Yes. Yeah, there are some bounds. Knowing in advance how many terms there there could be. Given, given. Uh, yes, yeah. So there is a bound on the polynomial degree. Uh, and the, so there's no a priori bound on the differential degree. Mm -hmm. But the um, uh, but the, the taking derivatives uh, changes the scaling dimension. So uh, because of so basically, if you if you take too many derivatives, your scaling dimension becomes so high that uh, you'll not be able to you know, uh, combine with anything else to give you something which has the right degree for a particular term here. So right. it effectively, that also bounds the differential degree. OK, so, so like given, given concrete um, fields, you, you are able to just write them down, all of them. Exactly, yeah. So in fact, this is what, what we did here in, yeah, yeah. in these examples. Right, so this so is, this is a lot of them. It's like complete list. Oh, can you also maybe say a little bit uh, more about this um, this this invariant theory that you yes, mentioned? Yes, right. So, um, so uh, uh, if if the the, the result that, that we needed uh, uh, would be a, some kind of actually didn't exist in the literature and uh, the precise version. So what I did is I. I wrote down what I wanted to be true, and then I called it a conjecture. <laughs> I believe it's true, but uh, as far as I know, it's not been precisely proven in, in the literature. So, um, uh, if you have uh, so this this theorem of Luna is basically the closest that, that comes to it. So let's say we have a um, uh, a linear representation of say the orthogonal group or a special orthogonal group. It could, could be any Lie group. Um, uh, importantly. We're talking about a non-compact Lie group. Um, so now we uh, somebody gives us uh, a scalar function on this on the vector space that carries the rep uh, representation, uh, which is invariant under the action of the Lie group. Uh, well, what we would like to be able to do is to give us some concrete form to this invariant. So the naive thing that that could be true is that okay. Um, when you look at polynomials uh, on this vector space that are invariant, uh, you can you know, use the Hilbert basis theorem uh, or whatever it's called uh, to, to show that uh, there, there is a, a finite generating set for the polynomial invariance. OK, great. Um, any smooth function of this finite generating set of polynomial invariants is also invariant. Uh, and um, when the group is compact, or, and uh, the, the Lie group is compact, or 
when the invariant is not just smooth but analytic, then there are theorems in literature that tell you that yes, uh, these are the only invariants that you can you can have. Um, the problem when you're just smooth and the Lie group is non-compact is that um, that is not enough. So what ends up being the necessary is that you have to take the representation. Uh, so you, you take the orbits of the representation of your Lie group on this vector space, and you have to break them up into regions. So the kind of the uh, canonical example of this is uh, uh, on, if you take uh, the Lorentz group uh, acting on say two dimensional or higher dimensional uh, uh, Minkowski space, right? So you have uh, uh, orbits of uh, vectors with say negative uh, Minkowski norm and positive Minkowski norm. They don't mix with each other. And right? this, this is the light cone. And what, what you, so polynomials, which are invariant, uh, have specific behavior going from the positive norm uh, vectors to negative norm vectors. Okay, so the any smooth function of these invariant polynomials, like the the invariant norm of a vector, uh, will uh, have correlated behavior uh, between the space-like and time-like cones. But mm -hmm. you can have smooth invariants, which are say zero on the time-like cone, but non-zero yet still invariant on the space-like part. Uh, sure. I think you don't see my, my pointer. No, no, I, I understand. You yeah. can just take yeah. like a bond, here. Bond so it's zero here, system. zero here, non-zero here, but still invariant. And that cannot be a smooth function of just the, of the polynomials generating the invariants. And so we needed some version of this theorem that, that took that into account. OK. And, and so far, it's just a conjecture, or yes, but yeah, I think it's so. the The precise statement is in our paper and uh, the second one, and uh, okay, you can I, I, have a look and decide how far it is from 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 being proven. Okay, thank you. And be, I'd be very curious on your your opinion, actually. So, if you okay, if you have I, a look, I, please let me know. So it's the the latest paper. Yeah. So. Um, The one with uh, Milati, yes, this this one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think. Uh... Then maybe all for today. Perhaps uh, can you share the slides uh, of your presentation? Yes, of course. Igor, I'll, since I'll you were very you. fast, thank you so much. So yeah. we will make them available, I think, in a Dropbox folder, which is accessible only by people in the mailing list. OK. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. We'll... Thank you for the talk. Thank yeah, you. Thank you for a very nice talk. It was very informative, yes. even for people who didn't have uh, 